All right, hello everyone. Uh, we're going to continue getting into some uh, lectures in childhood psychopathology. Um, we're going to get into talking about how we classify and diagnose mental disorders. Um, this is an area that is rife with difficulty. It's oftentimes culturally biased, culturally based. Um, and the issue with mental disorders is we oftentimes don't have anything neat and tidy way of deciding who might have a mental disease or disorder. Um, and so uh, this is both subjective and objective uh, in a variety of different ways. But what I'd like to do is just introduce this idea of classification. So it's basically um, a system for describing categories, groups, or dimensions, in this case of a disorder. You're all familiar with classification systems, so at some point you learned uh, this classification system for um, plants and animals. So we start with kingdom, and then we go to phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Um, and so this is how we try to classify whether or not something is um, uh, an animal, vegetable, or mineral, so to speak. <laughs> um, now, of course, classification systems are rife with difficulty. So, like, what do we do with viruses? Where do they go? Are they alive? Because bacteria now is, I think, a third kingdom. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a, I don't keep up with biology enough. I keep up with neurobiology, but not biology. Um, viruses, prions, all sorts of different ways in which we might have to think about um, classifying. And of course, it's all very subjective. Uh, when I teach cognition, one of the things I teach about is categorization. And um, the difficulty with categorization is trying to define even simple categories is often incredibly difficult. So, for example, if we want to try to define what a chair is. Well, how do you define a chair? Well, a chair is usually something you sit on, but there's lots of things you sit on that aren't chairs. Um, but there's also chairs that are things that are unusual, like a beanbag chair. Um, and so it's the same thing with mental disorders and even more difficult because we're talking about human behavior and difficulties in culture and all sorts of other issues. So classification and diagnosis are two different things. Classification is a way in which um, we kind of try to decide how to classify what might be a disorder. Diagnosis is assigning a specific diagnosis or putting an individual in that sort of classification system. Um, and much like the biological classification you see in front of you, uh, mental disorders oftentimes are um, grouped sort of hierarchically. So we talk about mood disorders, and then under that we get major depressive disorder. We have anxiety disorders, under which we might have panic disorder. Um, and so one of the ways we have to try to think about is all the ways in which some of this um, is oftentimes very difficult and um, very subjective. So that's quick introduction to classification versus diagnosis. So now that gets us into clinical categorical classification, which assumes that there are groups of individuals with relatively similar patterns of a disorder. And one of the things we find as we start understanding a disorder and then investigate it further that oftentimes while we've put people into one group, oftentimes we really need to be thinking about putting people into uh, different groups. So this is certainly one of the things that's happened with what we used to call spectrum disorders, autism, um, which is something of course we'll talk about, and Asperger's and other s similar kinds of disorders. Um, for older adults, Dementia is kind of a an umbrella classification for uh, mental difficulties as we get older uh, that are outside the no normal developmental timeline. But now, of course, we can start to think about when well, there's vascular dementia, there's Alzheimer's disease, and there's a mixed bag where people probably have both. And so none of this is as neat and tidy as we might like it to be. So with an ideal categorical scheme, each disorder would have its own specific etiology, course, and treatment. So here's what causes it. Here's how it goes along, and here's how we treat it. Unfortunately, uh, that's not how this usually works. So uh, we do our best. Um, we certainly don't understand the ideology of all mental disorders. We're getting a lot better. Um, and certainly when we talk about depression, uh, this is an area that um, we'll talk a lot about the underlying neuropathology of depression. But um, it's certainly a difficult area. So that gets us to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or the DSM. 
So it was originally introduced in 1955 and was sort of designed as a practical tool for clinicians. We're on DSM-5 um, in the sort of modern way in which we do things. Uh, DSM's getting updated more electronically than not. Um, as I was poking around on the DSM website, there's some really great tools on there. So you should definitely go on there and poke around. Uh, just Google DSM-5 and it'll take you right to the American Psychiatric Association. And so one of the things to understand about the DSM is <laughs> like all things that are horrible in the world, it is written by a committee. Um, and the DSM is useful. Certainly we need something um, to figure out a way in which to have um, some way in which to decide kind of as a society who has a particular disorder or disease, but it's very difficult. And so the f best thing to do is to go on and look at some of the comments about revisions. There's a lot of politics involved. Um, it, it, it's, it's messy, but for, um, my word, I think it's, you know, it's pretty good. It's also tied in with what's called the ICD-10, which is the international classification for all diseases and disorders. Um, and certainly you might want to poke around on that. Um, for those of you in my class, I have posted a link to the CDC's ICD-10, um, website so they have this tool where you can just plunk in some information and it will show you the diagnostic criteria for those uh, codes and that's anybody who's worked in a medical office those ICD-10 codes are particularly important for billing and that's one of the issues that we get into with the DSM is also has to do with billing for Medicare Medicaid and uh, private insurance and so you have to have a diagnosis to get reimbursed and you certainly have to have a diagnosis in order for you to uh, receive medications and for those medications to be covered by your insurance. It's kind of a messy world, but that's how we do it. Um, so a couple things about validity and reliability and this is kind of, I sometimes feel like shoehorning um, research ideas into practical clinical ideas, but I, I get where this oftentimes comes from. Reliability is certainly an incredibly important part of uh, the DSM and any sort of diagnosis. So it has to do with whether different clinicians using the same set of criteria classify children into the same clearly defined categories and whether or not over time um, that diagnosis is stable. So the first thing is what we call inter-rater reliability. And this is when two or more clinical psychologists come to the same decision about a type of disorder. And so essentially what we're talking about is if um, two different clinicians assess the same individual and they come up with the same or very similar diagnosis. Um, and I think uh, that's a really important way in understanding uh, clinical diagnosis. This is difficult. Any of you have ever been sick? <laughs> Um, I've gone to more than one doctor, and doctors might come up with the same decision or different decisions. Um, so even what we often think of as being a much uh, more traditional diagnostic um, situation is uh, rife with difficulty. Um, and so it's something we have to really be mindful of. Uh, the other way we think about inter reliability is cross-time reliability. Uh, when a child, in uh, this instance, is classified by the same clinician at two different points in time, so uh, you might take someone in for assessment um, in at the beginning of a school year and then again at the end of the school year. Now, of course, it's possible that some of that may have resolved. So major depressive disorder might have gotten better. Um, so certainly that's not going to indicate that that's not a reliable diagnosis. Things do change over time. And so thinking about inter -rater reliability and cross-time reliability, you always have to keep the context in mind. Validity um, is whether or not really the classification is getting at um, the disorder, the genuine disorder. And so is this a valid diagnosis? And I think this is where we've been really struggling with how to classify uh, autism type disorders and dementias because we really don't have a good handle on uh, the underlying disorder itself. So the validity of those diagnoses oftentimes comes into question. And I think this is even more difficult with children uh, because they're so rapidly changing. And so validity of diagnosis in children is going to be uh, something we're going to have to think about uh, over time. But is this really valid? We can talk about internal validity and external validity. So internal validity is going to tell us whether or not um, we have a good handle on the ideology of the disorder, what's causing it, what are the core patterns of symptoms, 
um, or difficulties experienced by children with a particular type or subtype of disorder. And so basically, within the course of a diagnosis or classification, um, is this all pointing us in the same direction and the correct direction? Um, to give you an idea, to go out of mental disease and disorder into sort of basic physical diagnosis, because it's really not all that different, um, is diagnosing uh, different types of pneumonia. And right now it's April of 2020. We're in the middle of the um, COVID-19 outbreak. And you've seen a lot of discussion about trying to classify a diagnosis as being pneumonia, flu, uh, COVID-19. And uh, I think it's an important question. Um, I encourage you to take a look at, uh, on my YouTube page, there is a video I just posted about testing and false positives and false negatives. It's an important thing to think about. Uh, but there are, there's a lot going on here, um, trying to figure out how to accurately diagnose that disorder. Um, and so thinking about that kind of validity is important. External validity, in this case, for uh, mental disorders tells us something about the implications of the disorder. So for children, we're generally going to be talking about uh, their educational attainment as well as their social functioning and their home functioning. And so outside of the child themselves, how are they interacting? Are they getting through school? Are they being disruptive? Or what's happening at home? All of those things are important parts of this. All right, so that gets us to dimensional classification. Kind of a more objective strategy for conceptualizing a disorder, particularly for children. So differences among children reflect differences in degree of a dimension rather than differences in kinds of dimensions. So basically the idea is rather than saying this person goes in category A and this person goes in category B, we're going to talk about this on um, a continuum. And so they are more autism-like than less Asperger's-like. Or um, they are... Um, not de having major depression, but maybe dysthymia, which is a sort of lighter version of depression. Doesn't feel that much lighter, but. Um, or, or is it an anxiety disorder versus a panic disorder? Um, these are important sort of degrees. And particularly for kids, we have to keep evaluating um, where they are sort of in the developmental timeline. And remember, every kid's going to develop differently. Um, I didn't get to be five foot eight until I was in college. Um, I was five foot four when I graduated from high school. Um, so I was really at the lagging end of the height end of development. And so we always have to think about developmental disorders and uh, whatnot in that kind of uh, context. So the benefits include uh, of dimensional classification, reduction of the large number of categories. We want to try to get it down to as discrete of categories as we can, because obviously the more discrete the categories are, um, the more finely honed the treatment is, etc. To give you an example um, of ways to think about this is cancer. Um, we've gone, come a long way in cancer treatment, and one of the things we're now doing is genotyping the person and oftentimes their cancer tumor, um, because that gets us right at here's exactly how we target that specific type of cancer. We've gone from giving everyone massive doses of radiation and chemotherapy to very targeted therapies. And so the better we get at diagnosis, the better we can get at treatment and understanding etiology. And so I think that's really particularly important. So while there is certainly continuous models of every kind of disease or disorder on the planet, um, one HIV a patient with no medication, which no one should ever do, you should always get medication for that disease, um, uh, one person might live a very long life, and the other person might not live the, out the year if they're not treated. And so it's the same thing with uh, mental diseases and disorders. People might have severe um, symptoms. Uh, they might do well with um, cognitive behavioral therapy. Others are going to need medication. Um, so there it is a continuum, but the better we can get and the more narrowly focused we can get in our diagnosis, the better we can treat. So... Two most commonly cited broad dimensions of disorder are externalizing dimensions and internalizing dimensions. Uh, for externalizing dimensions, behaviors such as oppositional or aggressive behaviors that are often directed at others, hence the name external. Internalizing dimensions are behaviors like anxiety, social isolation, um, mood disorders um, that are internal thoughts. Uh, and so, Oftentimes, the treatment for these, which we'll get to in a couple of lectures, is going to depend 
on the degree of externalized versus internalized dimensions. Um, and so uh, conduct disorder is going to be very externalized, whereas anxiety is going to be very internalized. So we have to think about that. Um, and in general, we tend to diagnose a child with a disorder when they exceed a certain number of symptoms. Um, the first thing to keep in mind is all of us have some degree of these, you know, a symptom here or there. Uh, it's disordered when we have many of these symptoms altogether and, of course, when it is disrupting our functioning. Concerns about classification systems uh, to think about are things like heterogeneity. I'm sorry if you can hear that. I don't know. Something's going on outside. Um, anyway, heterogeneity, the ways in which children with the same disorder or diagnosis display idiosyncratic sets of difficulties or symptoms. <laughs> Basically, uh, one child's not going to be just like another. Um, they're going to be different. They're going to display this differently. And so one child with depression is not going to look like another child with depression. One child with anxiety is not going to look like another child with depression. And that's really important for us to keep in mind. Comorbidity involves the co-occurrence of two or more disorders in one individual. Very common for someone to have anxiety and depression. Um, certainly we know that stress and anxiety are risk factors for depression, so those oftentimes come together. Uh, an individual might have a personality disorder on top of a mood disorder. Um, plus uh, other comorbidities. So for example, on an HIV patient, we often see anxiety and depression going along with all of that. So all of those comorbidities would be considered together. All right, so those are classification and diagnosis systems. Quick introduction, we're gonna dive more into how we assess children and how it's associated with diagnosis in the next lecture.